Hello, welcome to Security, Cryptography, Whatever. I'm Deirdre. I'm Tom. And we have two special guests today. We have Franciscus. Hi, Franciscus. Hi. Awesome. And we have Karthik. Hi, Karthik. Hello, folks. Hey, and they're both from Crispin. And we've decided, well, they wrote a really nice blog post and they have a very nice brand new high assurance implementation of what was once called Kyber. And now we're all trying really hard to now call ML Chem because ML Chem is something slightly different than what we used to call Kyber. And it's written in pure Rust, basically. Can you tell me about what you wrote and how you wrote it? Yeah, well, it is pure Rust, but with some C in it. Uh, oh. Because I think Kyber is not just Kyber or ML Chem, but it needs actually SHA-3 and ah. Shake. And so, yes, we implemented all of Kyber in Rust, but we are still using a C implementation of SHA-3. I see. I didn't realize that, so I'm very glad I asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. So what makes this different than just another random person who wrote, who wrote some Rust and pulls in a, you know, implementation of SHA-3 that's C underneath or something like that? Well, everything we are doing, we try to do in a high assurance manner. And uh, so I guess we should be talking a little bit about what high assurance means for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, of course, on the one hand, it means using something like Rust and not C. Uh, but it also means we are doing proofs on the correctness. So if you use our implementation, it's supposed to be provably correct. Cool. And just to clarify, the underlying C code for SHA-3 as well as the Rust code for Kyber, it's all been proven correct. Awesome. I know SHA-3 is like easier than, say, these high-level structures like MOCAM or anything using like elliptic curves to implement securely with memory safety and with outside channels and things like that. But like guarantees beyond correctness for your SHA-3 implementation, is there sort of what 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 can we get in there if it's based in C? Oh, so uh, for C, we use, uh, you know, we have this library that we've been con contributing to for a few years now called Hacklestar, uh -huh. which is a, a library which is written in this language called F-star, actually a subset of it called Lowstar, but then it compiles down to C using a high assurance pipeline. And so the C code is proven to be memory safe, to be secret independent, and to be uh, functionally correct with respect to like a higher level spec. With SHA-3, the high level spec is not that high level. It's yeah. just that it's correct with respect to the RFC. But awesome. as I don't know if you saw the, the post by and the paper by Nikki Muha recently, even you might Im imagine that SHA-3 is obviously correct, but there are buggy implementations of uh, Ketchak out there, including sometimes reference implementations. So... It's, oh. it's worthwhile proving that correct. We'll, we'll get back to buggy reference implementations in a little bit. Um, so I've been tracking your libcrux library for a little while now, including this, this implementation. And one of the things that I find attractive about it is that it is a high assurance version. It is Rust with, you know, a, a sub dependency that wraps high assurance C. Um, that is, you know, the hackle star variant of, of SHA-3. But this seems to be sort of like the next, you know, step change from what we used to look at for hack spec, which was a specific high assurance compiling specification subset of Rust. And now this seems to be kind of like the next step beyond that, which is it lets you do a lot more pure Rust, a lot more fully functional pure Rust. Uh, hack spec was a little bit more limited to be almost purely functional although it evolved over time. And this is like, you're basically writing pure Rust. You get almost everything you can get out of, you know, high level Rust with a couple of, you know, safety caveats or whatever. And you can use the hacks tool to compile it to uh, backends like F star and a couple of others we could talk about later. And this lets you write these proofs, right? So can you tell me right. about how that works? and what you proved, and why did you use these specific tools, and I'm talking about F-star, to write these proofs? So, uh, yeah, I mean, Deirdre mentions hack spec, which is a, a specification language that was inspired partly by this hack series of workshop uh, workshops where lots of people 
were very interested in including data in writing <laughs> things in Rust, but at the same time were specifying new crypto primitives and new crypto constructions. And there was always there's always been this gap between pseudocode, which appears in papers and in standards, and the reference code, which is specifically C, and there's like a big gap. Mm. Some people like to fill in that gap with Sage and Python and stuff, and that's good for math stuff, but not always applicable for, you know, for the details of a crypto algorithm. Mm. So Hackspec tried to fill in this gap of, okay, maybe you can write your specifications and have that be very close to a reference implementation, which still can be executed and get test vectors and so on out of. But as you noticed, I mean, it's still, it is very limited. So you can't really mm. write code, code in it. And we wanted to verify code and write code for, for Kyber. So Hacks is this new tool chain that we've developed uh, in collaboration with Inria. And there's other collaborators who are working with us at the University of Aarhus, University of Porto. And the idea behind it was uh, that, okay, let's just expand it out and say, anything you write in Rust, we will try to consume. But of course, right now we don't consume everything, you know. Mm. Um, and we will produce some reasonable model in the backend. Now, the reasonable means it's syntactically correct. But of course, doing the proof on the generated artifact might be quite hard because we, you give us a really complicated loop, we might produce really complicated loop-like structures and then proving things about it might be quite tricky. So the more you restrict yourself in your source language, the easier sometimes it is to prove things about what you get out. But you can still generate something and still try to prove something about it. Mm. So that kind of liberated us a bit, I think. I mean, I think Francis will agree that he was very frustrated with the previous version because he, yes. he wants to write <laughs> expressive stuff, right? Mm. And, and you couldn't really, you, could write, you, could, you couldn't even consume it. Now, at least we can consume arbitrary looking code. And then we can worry about, okay, now is this provable? If not, maybe we'll restrict ourselves, annotate the source and so on. Mm. So the tool basically takes Rust. Uh, it it's basically plugs into the Rust compiler. Uh, nice. Takes uh, the theory representation for those who are interested in it and then translates it uh, out to, uh, using a sequence of transformations until it gets to an intermediate language, which is pretty simplified, let's say almost purely functional. And then depending on the back end, you do some other things. So you can go out to Proverif, to F star, to Coq. Uh, Fstar and Coq are the most developed backends, I would say. Mm. There's also an in-progress backend for EasyCrypt. So once you get out there, then you can try to do some proofs. That's basically how it works. So That's uh, awesome. Does this kind of compiling to an intermediate backend language put any constraints on the sort of code that you write at the top level? For example, in Hackspec, it was very, very functional. Like you can't do a lot of structs. You can't do a lot. You can't do traits. There's a, well, for most of the existence of Hackspec, there was a lot of sort of uh, constraints imposed on the top level subset of code that you would write. Is there anything like that for the code that hacks will consume and turn into a useful uh, intermediate version to translate to one of these backends? Well, uh, one of the main, the biggest constraints is that what we don't want, okay, we, we don't really do a very good job of handling aliasing right now because it's kind of hard to do that in uh, verification uh, tools. So there are other tools that do kind of can handle it, but we're trying to kind of just do crypto core. Mm -hmm. So one of the big limitations is if you write a function which is going to return an borrowed mut mutable borrow, like an mm. and mute pointer, uh, that will not be accepted by hacks in its current state. Of course, this might change in the future, but for now, you can pass in and mute parameters and modify them. That's not an issue. But returning a mutable borrow to, uh, to a structure is something we do not support. And that actually simplifies life a lot. Actually. Yeah. It makes a lot of things possible. Yeah. Like my first instinct when writing uh, obviously safe, maybe not the blazingest, fastest, most efficient Rust code in the universe, but like you can read it and it's pretty obviously not doing any shenanigans. I would just not do a lot of those things. But of course, I'm not, you know, I do not tend to work on a lot of embedded devices that work do, you know, uh, without uh, without allocating on the heap or any of that sort of thing. So I can see where for some people, they might be a little annoyed at those things. But it's also like, well, where is your trade-off going to be? Do you want to try to do some tricks elsewhere 
to not have mutable, not have some aliasing, not have a couple of these things so that you can have that high assurance. I bet there's like a, a sweet spot that you can get. And Franciscus, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what optimizations in the Kyber now ML Chem, like optimized implementation you were able to do and then being able to prove correctness between sort of like the higher level spec version that you wrote that also compiles with with the hacks tool. Uh, what optimizations you put in that were able to squeeze out a lot of performance? Because this implementation is both high assurance and very efficient. It's very fast. Yeah. Actually, I think the first point there really is that even if we don't use any, like, well, not a lot of mutable burrows and more of these things, this does not actually impact performance. Uh, so we played a lot around with, like, okay, do we have to go a step further and actually use mutable burrows and extend our tool to handle these things? But it doesn't make any difference uh, in performance, really. Awesome. So that was, I think, very interesting uh, to see. And this implementation does not do any sort of SIMD thing. So like there are yeah. implementations out there that are using AVX2 to mm -hmm. speed up and parallelize some of the stuff. That's something we don't do yet. Uh, that's on the roadmap and we'll do this year soon. So and in that sense, you're limited in what you can do in terms of uh, performance. But really what we are doing, I think one thing that's different from other implementations is the representation. So most implementations we know of use I-16s instead of I-32s, which we use okay. to allow us to go a little further. So we don't have to reduce right away, but we can yeah. multiply a couple of times more before we have to reduce because reducing is expensive. Mm -hmm. And then I think the really what allows us to go a step further because of course, as I said, like reducing is expensive and we want to do it only a few times. And so we try to fill up the I-32s as far as possible. And of course that's risky. So because you might run into corner cases where you overflow or something. Mm -hmm. And that's something where the formal verification helps us because there we can prove that we never overflow. So we can skip another couple of reductions and make it a little faster. That is really nice. So it's not just the formal verification to, to prove that you didn't uh, to prove that you didn't fuck up, right. <laughs> to prove that you're actually implementing the thing. And then later we can talk about this sort of proof of secret independence. But it's also literally helping you eke out performance wins because you are proving that you're not overflowing here and that you can use a different uh, you can prove that you are doing things safely while trying to eke out one less reduction step or, you know, and more reduction steps. That's nice. I really like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I think like writing high performance crypto code is always dangerous because you try to like go all the way. So it's nice if you have tools that tell you, okay, it's safe what you're doing and not just a couple of test vectors. So maybe you're missing one. Yeah. I think an interesting point there as well is that, especially when you're looking at, okay, uh, almost all of the code, except in one very corner case, when everything was up to the field element limit, you might just go over I-31 or I-32 just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Then uh, it's very difficult to kind of trigger that case using testing, right? So yeah. the test vectors, probably not. Even if you fuss the heck out of it, you'll, if you're lucky, you'll find the exact case where you go over but I-32 is, uh, is rare enough. I mean, yeah, so there, especially I think the formal verification really kind of helps us because, you know, we know that you're not just missing it because you didn't test enough or fuzz enough, but actually it's, uh, you covered all the cases. That's awesome. You guys are like, you're just talking about how like hacks doesn't currently handle functions returning immutable borrows and then like, you know, you, you test it and surprise mutable borrows don't matter that much. But from the blog post, I also got the impression that like there's a back and forth in terms of how you're writing the Rust code and the output that you're getting in F star and how easy it is to actually do proofs with that output. Mm -hmm. Like how much work goes into like restructuring the source code so that like not just getting a, a usable IR for F star, but also something that you can I have no intuition for what that work looks like, but I'm curious about it. Yeah. So one thing is for sure that if you have a humongous function in F star, 
you're going to struggle. And this is true for a guest or call, call of these backends because okay. typically you're collecting more and more verification conditions as you're going through the function and somehow you're going to prove them. And by the by the end of the function, your context is pretty large in terms of what you're trying to prove. And FSTAR is relying on a SMT solver called Z3. So the, con- the size of the context is kind of important, hmm. especially if you're doing nonlinear arithmetic or arithmetic involving multiplication modulus, this kind of stuff. These SMT solvers are particularly not going to be great at. They do great at small problems, but not at large problems. Mm-hmm. So you have to avoid the problem getting too huge. So one restructuring thing that you often do is to break down the functions into clean units, which have their mm-hmm. local conditions that you need to prove about them. Because then you just verify one function, then you go to the next function, then you go to the next function, you can do this incrementally. And that's fine. And sometimes, and at least in some places, so the way this worked out was, you know, Gautam Tamwara, who was working with us, uh, he wrote a lot of the Kyber implementation and he doesn't know his chart. So he just wrote it like a Rust developer. He just wrote down the implementation. And naturally, he was breaking things down to make them kind of be nice and closer to the spec. Yeah. And in some places, you would go back and say, hey, can you restructure this? Because it was just creating too larger an FSTAR uh, program. And he would. And some of these restructures were annoying. But many of these restructures, I think, I don't know, Francis, because what do you feel? But produce code that is actually cleaner and more clearer to understand what it is trying to do. That would be my instinct, too, that you're like, oh, break it down into better, more like reasonable units of code. And I'm like, that sounds like good software engineering. That sounds like better maintainable and understandable code to me. Yes, but it definitely is. Uh, I mean, sometimes you have to be a little careful because, of course, if you pull things apart, your compiler might not be as good in optimizing it. So you have to be a little careful sometimes, but it certainly makes the code look nicer. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. This is sort of stuff that that's not really obvious from the outside about the winds of some of these formal verif- verification techniques. Does this come out just from F star or does this come out from any of the back end tools that you can compile hacks code to? I would go even further. I think any formal verification or formal method technique you apply to software probably you'll go through pretty much the same set of things, even though if you don't use that tool. Yeah. I mean, it'd be fun to ask the LibJade guys about their experience. Hey. Who, because the foremost are crypto people who also have a verified implementation of uh, of Kyber in, in assembly. And I love, I've seen their code and it's beautiful. And it also does the same kind of thing. You have to break it down to small functions so you can prove equivalence between different ver- versions of a function. So it's, yeah, I think this is the kind of thing that you end up doing Anyway, I guess something different from what you were doing was really because we have this kind of two, two faceted company where uh, cryptographic engineers are really building software and there's some proof people who are really doing the proofs. We are really forced to face that, uh, you know, whatever we do, we can't put too many restrictions on the Rust programming. You can't just say, okay, we use a new language. Mm. You can totally use the same thing while, you know, we can kind of have this exchange. I think that's sort of been a bit interesting here. That's lovely. Can you talk a bit about the secret independence proving stuff that you did here? And first up, is that something that is only doable in with F star or is it also doable in some of these other uh, backend tools? Can you do that with EasyCrypt, even though EasyCrypt's not fully supported yet? I don't know. So actually you can do it in Rust. <laughs> what? So, <laughs> How? So... What we're doing is a very crude form of uh, side channel protection, right? It's what we call secret independence. It's just to make sure that you don't branch on uh, secrets. You don't use secrets as indices. You don't do dangerous operations like division or whatever yeah. on secrets. And for that, we have this crate that we developed a few years ago, which we need to really refresh, uh, called secret integers, uh, yes. which you just, uh, so you just use standard as uh, typing is able to enforce those disciplines. Hopefully in a zero uh, cost way, the first version of that crate we put out maybe is not zero cost, but can be made zero cost. So it can be done in any type system. So a lot of these tools are capable of doing it. Huh. What we do is we actually come, because we already were compiling all this code to, to F star. And in F star, there's already a technique for secret independence that is used by Hackle star, the same technique. Got so it. we wanted to get the same guarantees as Hackle star gives. So we just use the same technique in F star to verify secret independence which is basically just making sure nowhere in this code is there any branch on the secret and stuff like this. Okay. So that's that's kind of what we analyze. But 
just to clarify, many of the other tools that do crypto proofs, uh, for example, LibJade is able to prove very interesting side channel protections. Cool. And just, just to make sure we contextualize, this sort of provable attribute means that we are far less likely to have timing-based side channels about that you can use to leak the secret, like the in this case, the MLCAM decapsulation key or the, sh- the shared secret. Is it both of them? It's both of them, yeah. Great. Anything that is labeled a secret in your, including the randomness, for example, you don't want to leak something or the randomness. So anything that is a secret in your system, anything you label as a secret, anything you, you don't label as public. Yeah. Actually, uh, it's, uh, you want to prove that you're not leaking things about it. And the guarantees you get are not amazing. You can do better, but it is that if you have a remote attacker who's trying to use the timing of decapsulation to figure out whether your recipient uh, to find, find bits of your key and or, or your secret, then you can at least make it much harder by doing, yeah. by ensuring secret independence. Nice. Of course, in the world of Spectre and Meltdown and stuff, there's a lot more you need yeah, to do. Yeah, to yeah. But this is sort of like, at least the bar we want the software to meet. Yeah, it's so. a minimal bar, yeah. Yeah. So like, just so I understand like the timeline here, what, what basically happened. So you all wrote a simple implementation of Kyber in Rust, following the spec as close as possible, like a reference Rust implementation. And then you used hacks to convert that to F-star and started doing formal stuff with that Rust code. With the impression I get from the blog post is your initial aim was what we were talking about just now, just the performance gains that you were getting, like proving that you can do 32-bit integers instead of 16-bit integers, things like that, right? And it's at that point after you do that that you find the secret dependent division. Or is it the other way around? The The nut of this story here, as far as I'm concerned, is you guys found a vulnerability in a bunch of implementations of Kyber that lit a whole bunch of people up. And I'm kind of curious whether like you went in looking for that first or whether that kind of fell out of implementation work you were doing anyways. Right. So the way our, our methodology works is that when we compile to F-star, F-star, and we just try to type check in F-star without even trying to prove correctness. It's the basic type checking in F-star. It enforces a whole bunch of conditions. For example, a code that comes out in F star, if F star just type checks it without any new specs, no post conditions, no whatever, no correctness, just trying to type check it basically, it will be panic free in Rust. So panic freedom is our, like a bottom uh, nice. level. So without panic freedom, we can't prove anything fall further. So mm-hmm. we prove that all the code is panic free. And at the same la- layer, since we are using integer types, we have a choice whether we are going to use integer types, which are secret or integer types, which are all open and public. So on our first round, we started with all public integers, but in Hacklestar, we use secret integers as default. All integer values, any value in your system is by default secret unless you explicitly label that, oh, I want, this is a public input, like a public key or something. So the moment you label your types as, if you switch to the secret types, secret integer types, which for us is pretty easy because that's what is already available in a star then just the basic type checking, you know, you don't even have to do any new proof will immediately throw up every single place in the code where you are doing things like, for example, division over uh, <laughs> secret integers. So that's where this thing popped up. We saw that there was a division with Kyber Q, which is a prime uh, of a value. And by default, everything is secret. So it's like, oh, it's a secret. And we looked at it and this was in a function called compress message. So we knew that the message was secret. And so we said, ah, so this is a secret dependent division. We can't do this in our system. So for us, that doesn't mean that we found an attack. What it means is that our type checking is failing. So either there is some assumption about Kyber, some mathematical assumption or crypto assumption, which makes us safe, which is possible, or you know this is a bug. So we basically contacted the Kyber authors and said, hey, there is this division here. We see the same division in your reference code. Is there some assumption about lattice cryptography, which I don't know much about, <laughs> which says this is okay. Yeah. And Peter Peter Schwaber was like, oh, this looks not so safe, so we're going to change it. I, actually, I think it's it's uh, worth pointing out also to to save Peter. Uh, so <laughs> I, think, I think he was very much aware of that division there, but the way it's used in this case, it's supposed to be compiled into a multiplication. Uh, but you can't rely on the fact that your compiler yeah. is actually doing that. Yeah. And we found lots of compilers who don't do it. Was this like a Clang variant that is a sort of like, it usually does the right thing, but there are plenty other C variants that just don't? Do you want, do you know? No? Yeah, okay. it's, 
I think actually, I think we found only like a couple who compile it to a multiplication. And I think most mainstream compilers will just do a division. Yeah. I would also not love to rely on that either. <laughs> I guess it depends on platform, the optimization level, the compiler version, too many op options there. Yeah. I don't love relying on that. It's another thing that's like, it's so tough. C is a very old language. There's a lot of, of, you know, implementations of C. So there's a lot of diversity and like you hand some C and, there, you know, I won't get into like the specification of C and undefined, undefined behavior and all that other stuff. But like there's a lot of way, a lot of different ways you can take a pile of C, put it through some compiler and get something. And I was about to say something else. I don't remember what it was. But uh, even in Rust, trying to make sure that, say, if you're if you're familiar with the zero wise crate where you're trying to really, really as hard as you can in top level Rust, make sure that a type is zero wise out of memory when it's dropped, when it's out of scope. Even that is like not bulletproof. And that's not because the Rust compiler has a lot of variants. There's not a lot of variants to, that lets you take some Rust and compile it. It's because different platforms, different uh, backends to LLVM are slightly different and things like that. So much as to say like, it's really tough to rely on your compiler, even if you don't have a heterogeneous ecosystem of compilers. So having something like F star, or some of these other formal backends is like yet another way to like catch something that even if you have like a trusted compute base with only one compiler and only one this and only one backend target or something like that, it gives you even better assurance that you're not missing something or something's getting switched out from under you under the hood. I would still warn that, you know, I think you still need to run a bunch of tools on the mm. on your assembly, on your machine that you care about. Oh, sure. Because there are things that are passing through and the microarchitectural stuff, of course. But um, so there are there's, there's some nice tools that you can run to just check that your final, final, final machine code is still exhibiting constant time behavior or, or secret independent behavior. Yeah. And uh, I wouldn't trust that us C to do perfectly well on all the code even that we write. So. Oh, no, yeah. I have a dumb question here. So um, the, the impression I get from your description of how you landed on the, uh, the compression function um, secret division, right, is basically like you've exported the rest code into F star, into heckle spec or whatever, and heckle spec is secret by default. It's like the first thing that pops out of this is like a, you know, it's just a basic failing type check that, you know, you're, you're passing a secret into, you know, the division operation, right? So you had mentioned earlier, there's an assembly implementation of Kyber that's also been formally, and Peter Straba is on a paper that did a formally verified Kyber. I'm just curious, like, this is more about my not understanding formal methods enough so this this might be a very silly question right but like why do you think you guys were the first to i know that like you just said that like peter for instance was aware that the division was there but believed that like it was going to get compiled into you know a safer multiplication rather than the dangerous division operation but like it's still there in the reference code right so like why didn't any other formal implementation already flag this and tell people to fix their code Okay, so I mean, the, the assembly verified implementation, of course, doesn't have this bug, right? Because they prove side channel resistance for their code. So there is, there's sort of two schools of thought here, right? So one is that, in fact, there is no hope to any side channel checks on high level languages like Rust and C, because in the end, your compiler is going to defeat you, your architecture is going to defeat you. So do you really need to do Spectre and various other kinds of low level side channel analysis on the generated assembly code? as close for a particular platform and each platform you care about. So for example, the, the verified assembly implementation does that. They do very comprehensive checks at the lowest level that they are at, which is assembly. And, you know, there's other tools that people use for doing checks at that. So there's one school of thought that there's no point doing it in the high level. Just compile it all the way to assembly or verify the assembly or do the analysis at the assembly level or even low for if you can. The uh, other viewpoint, which is ours, is that, well, I think portable implementations are useful, and I think mm. we should not be encouraging people to write assembly code if we cannot, and only there's six people in the world who can write good crypto assembly, and they're already doing it. They're great, mm -hmm. but you know, for, for the rest of us, I think we need to write code in high-level languages, and we need tools to kind of stop us from making mistakes as early as possible, rather than waiting all the way till somebody's going to inspect the assembly. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the bug was ignored, Thomas, to answer your question, because maybe... People had some assumptions about the C compiler, but also because maybe nobody was looking too deeply at side channels at the high level. I don't know, Francisco, do you have any other instinct for 
What does yeah, this I, I mean, as far as I know, there is no other verified implementation other than the libjade one, which doesn't have that issue because it's in assembly. So I don't think anyone else looked at it with this type of tool. And I think the other one is more of an issue that like everyone just goes and copies the reference code and mm -hmm. well, it's by the authors of Kyber. It must be safe and correct, right? Yeah. yeah. Famous last words. Um, <laughs> it's, it's still, it's, it's a big win for the approach, right? Like, you know, it's like the, the first thing that popped out of it was, you know, a pretty serious vulnerability. I have another question about the process of going from basic formal verification to finding vulnerabilities. But before I ask that question, I'm assuming that like, I'm kind of on this program a stand in for all the people in the audience that don't know enough about MLCAM to discuss it. So like, there's, can we get some like background? Uh, there's two settings that for the for the vulnerability that you guys basically instigated. I, I I gather that like the the compression one was you, and then the other one, which we'll get to in a second, might not have been um, like something that you guys directly flagged. But like the basic thing that you guys flagged, do, do you guys have a like an intuitive explanation for where in the MLCOM process that hits? Well, this is during decryption. So uh, this is the last step of decryption to reconstruct the plain text message. That is this function that is called, which is then doing a division on the plain text message and on, on components of the plain text message, message. So that's where the vulnerability we found hits. But that's actually an, an interesting uh, your follow up for, related to your question is that uh, there's another place where there's a division and that's in a function which divides the ciphertext. So uh, mm. after encryption, what they after the NCP encryption, the ciphertext is divided. And this is again, this is so we and many other people assume, okay, ciphertext, so this is public. So mm -hmm. division on the ciphertext looks okay. So we explicitly mark this as public. So we declassify this byte to be public. And so we allow division there. Otherwise, by default, our tool just says, no, we are doing division, no, no, no. But we have to like say, oh, this one is okay because this is public. And this is what a lot of people assume, but this actually wasn't. Because so everything is secret by default unless you explicitly mark it public. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so please. That's, that's, <laughs> that's our default. So we, we flip it that way. Yeah. And so there is actually a place in decryption that in the NCCA decryption that the NCPA encryption is used and the ciphertext <gasps> that comes out of the NCPA encryption in CCA decapsulate is still sensitive uh, at this point. And so when you divide it, uh, you do a division on it, you're actually leaking something about the sensitive ciphertext that you have in the NCCA decapsulate. So, but since it was like called ciphertext, it's the yeah. NCPA ciphertext, we said, ah, this is public. So we kind of, we lost, we dropped the ball on that one. Other people are surprised by this too. Oh shit, this is actually, this is actually important. So yeah, so there's a second group with Prasanna and Mateus and uh, who came up and who discovered this set up, this other division was dangerous too, and they could see the timing in their analyses when uh, they, they actually. So it's the ciphertext from the internal PKE, exactly. uh, and then that is part of an input to computing the recomputing the shared secret, right? I think so. Yes, yes. Because it's a the FO transform implicit exactly. rejection. Blah, blah, blah. FO transform. Yes. Right, yeah. and if you're computing, yeah, if you're leaking that. Uh, you have a very close uh, uh, correlation to the final output shared secret from the implicit rejection. Or you can detect if it's implicit, if you're rejecting with noise or you're rejecting with the key and, and things like that. Yeah, I can see that. Oh, yes, wow. So. <laughs> I mean, this is the kind of thing that I actually assumed was true in the beginning when, when Gautam and I were looking at the code and, and seeing why this division where the division was for the for even the message ciphertext. I was like, oh, there must be some assumption somewhere that at this point it's okay <laughs> because something has happened. And it wasn't. But then we kind of missed the other one. We said, oh, that called ciphertext, surely it's public. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. It's, nope. Oh, <laughs> it my God. No, <laughs> it's, it's a secret third kind of ciphertext <laughs> that is if you're using the PKE outside of this chem transform, maybe it is public, maybe but it, you're maybe not. It is public. It's it's another kind. <laughs> it's a secret ciphertext. This might be beyond uh, you know your your project, but this strikes me as possibly yet another class of bug that we may see in using the FO transform to create chems. 
which is that people are used to ciphertext being ciphertexts. And in the Diffie-Hellman world, which Kem seemed to be trying to or approaching replacing for PQ, for post-quantum and things like that, there's a real ciphertext, the encapsulation of your shared secret, but there may be other ciphertexts that are not actually public knowledge uh, and oh, available to the world. Do you think that, like, I'm slowly accumulating a short list of, like, things to be aware of when you're either creating a chem with an FO transform, and that's, are you using explicit or implicit, implicit rejection and things like that? Now I'm adding this thing to the list, which is, yes, you have a PKE ciphertext. That is a secret data type. It is not public data. And then some other things about, like, are you committing to the ciphertext? Are you binding to the publicly? There's some things like that. Do you have a sense of, like, that being a thing? Or do you think it might just be Kyber or whatever? Well, uh, one thing I think is generally the case that when you make larger constructions from these uh, new PQ constructions, including hybrid cams, including uh, when you put them in protocols like PQ, XTH, yeah. and things like that. I think there are pitfalls. There is no, it's easily possible. I mean, I think it's always the case with crypto. This just that we are not unfamiliar with these new PQ boxes, right? Mm -hmm. That you want to treat it as a box and not have to look <laughs> inside it. But in fact, the it has preconditions. So you have to only use it in certain ways. And uh, you may be making an incorrect assumption about how it is and how it kind of interacts. So, yeah, oh, I mean, amazing. I think we don't really know yet what all the pitfalls are. And that's oh, why I no. think it's so important <laughs> to actually try to verify and try to do like all the things we know of, at least to find all the things and then hopefully come up with a correct implementation and a safe one. Awesome. Before I go completely off, I'm, gonna, I'm looking at everything else that I wanted to ask. It seems like F star is powerful in proving high level properties about like the algorithms that you are implementing. Other tools such as your easy crypt uh, and maybe maybe we could talk about crypto verif or something like that seem to be much closer to proving security properties like you would in a pen and paper cryptographic proof. How do you see maybe you take your your implementation and you compile it to be able to prove things about it in EasyCrypt. What do you think you would tackle there first that kind of is in a is in harmony with F star? So you do all this other stuff with F star, and now you want to do things that you can't really do with F star, but you could do with EasyCrypt. So in fact, I think this is a, a central sort of design goal of this hacks tool chain that we have, which is kind of to be tool agnostic when you program your code. Mm -hmm. but then be able to apply the tool that is best for a particular use case. So yeah. in the past with F-Star, even because I've worked with for many years now, we invented it, I don't know, 2010 or something. We tried to do everything in one tool. And that's what a lot of people who use Coq do, everything in one tool, even <laughs> easy Crypt and Jazz and everything in one. And I think it goes far in terms of research because you have already got students and postdocs who understand this one language, this one tool. So you can really all just be in that ecosystem. But I think it really lacks separation of concerns and that forces verification to be much like Francis Kaskey pointing me, pointing out to me that verification tools are like 90 software engineering, whereas software engineering has gone much further ahead. Yep. We still are using like old monolithic styles of doing things. So the idea here is really that, yeah, so yeah, there's a protocol module, there is a code module, there's a serialization module. And you want to verify them with different tools. So you yeah. want to prove that your deserialize and serialize are correct and there's no bug in your parsing. And that maybe is a more like an F star style proof. Mm -hmm. And then there's your protocol bit or your construction bit and you want to prove security for it. That might be more of an easy crypt kind of thing that you want to prove. And then there's secret independence which you want to prove for everything, you know, and but it's a very simple property. So you don't necessarily need to invoke all of F star or all of easy crypt on this. So you might want to use the same code but try to apply different tools for the different properties you're trying to prove. And we're trying to do this in a somewhat sound way, but we are also kind of not ashamed because we're not pure, pure academics of saying that, okay, there is no relationship between this F-star proof and this easy proof, but you believe us that we're doing kind of related things and they kind of fit together. Yeah. So you know, being more pragmatic than, than dogmatic here is for this, uh, for this purpose. Yeah. Relatedly, I remember something that was proven about hacks back at the time 
that their translations were sound, that there was indistinguishability between translating from hack spec to F star or to what or to cock or whatever it was, so that you do have some sort of I don't know, you can have some sort of assurances about that you are actually doing what you're saying you're doing. Um, am I misremembering that? And if I'm not misremembering it, is there anything kind of coming? Are you aware of anything that's coming with that for now? Hack spec to your either to your intermediate representation or to to F star to easy crypt or whatnot. So at the moment, we have nothing of that sort. Okay. Uh, with hack spec, we uh, we formalized the translations, but we never proved anything about about it. Okay. There are other research projects that are working on doing formalized translations from Rust to, to backend tools, but, uh, to various provers. But actually, even the Rust operation semantics is not formalized anywhere. So it's yeah. kind of a, <laughs> it's, it's a big project. I would say it's, it's about a PhD or two to, to do this kind of thing okay. properly for Rust. But so, so, I mean, what exists, so Buspita's group in, in Aarhus, so they have a translation to COC and to SS proof. And they have an equivalence proof between those two outputs. So they are looking into, okay, can we do equivalence proofs between the different outputs for the different tools that gives us some assurance on that it's correct. It's not a proof or anything. It's just an indication that, yeah, we probably don't mess up in the translation. Cool. That's All right. Just, I forgot about that. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I'll pivot into how... The stuff you're doing in, say, F star and maybe future in EasyCrypt compares, contrasts with the stuff you did for uh, your analysis of PQXDH for the signal, which used a different set of tools altogether, which was Proverif, which is in the symbolic model, uh, which is different than the previous two things we've been talking about, and CryptoVerif, which is almost kind of in the same wheelhouse as EasyCrypt. And for, uh, we, we mentioned this a couple episodes ago. PQXDH is, is the signal protocols stab that's been rolled out to upgrade their first key exchange to set up a new, uh, signal conversation, but mixing in Kyber to make it work and be quantum resilient, at least for the, the, the first step in that, in that handshake. And you guys did analysis of their proposal protocol. And then you look at their their software imp implementation. Can you tell us a little bit about the analysis using Proverif and CryptoVerif? Sure. So the one distinctive distinctive thing between what you're talking about with Kyber and PQXTH, which is one level up, yeah. is that uh, PQXTH, we analyze the design of the protocol, yes. not the code. Uh, because the code for protocol like PQXTH, <laughs> too many letters in the <laughs> The trouble is that it's actually in interleaved and intermixed with uh, the standard ratchet code in Signal. If you go look at it, you won't actually find a module called BQXH. It's yeah. actually just one thing deep inside the ratchet.rs file. So it's so if you analyze the code, you'd have to analyze all of Signal, everything, right? Yeah. Then you can't just pull it out. But the design of BQXH has a very nice design document uh, written by the Signal folks so that they put that out and uh, that makes it a good basis for analysis. So for that, when you're looking at the design of protocols like PQXTH and other protocols like TLS or MLS, uh, and you're trying to analyze it, you can formalize it in tools using the symbolic model like Tamarin or Proverif right. or computational model like EasyCrypt or CryptoVerif. And these are really tools for analyzing protocols. So okay. that's what we used. We use that in, in collaboration with Charlie Jacom and Rolfo from Signal. We uh, formalized this thing and analyzed whether or not it satisfied all the properties you could you could desire. And uh, then we proposed improvements to it, which the signal guys were very nice to kind of incorporate into their next draft and so on. So Proverif is like a push button tool. So you just <laughs> model a, a protocol in it and you press a button. So it doesn't, it's not very expressive, but for what it can do, it's amazing, right? Hmm. So I think that's kind of, I think it's a it's a classic thing in this in this domain. If you really understand what your goals are, you should really use the tool that is best at it because there's mm -hmm. probably one or two tools that are really good at it. But they can't do, for example, serialization proofs or they Proverif can't be used to analyze Kyber. It's just an out of scope. Yeah. But for protocol analysis, it's great. And and CryptoVerif is a companion or sister tool to Proverif, which does crypto proofs. So 
Provative can find attacks and Cryptovative can actually build a full crypto proof for a for protocol. Cool. So that's what you used for, for that analysis. Cool. And to be explicit, when we're talking about protocols, we're talking about basically message the, the layer up from using from something like Kyber, where we're talking about, hi, I'm a client. I'm going to send you a message that contains these things. And you're like, hi, I'm a ser- server or a peer. And I, I given a message from a client, I respond with this sort of message, sort of like TLS or some of these other higher level protocols that use uh, a primitive like Kyber or traditionally Diffie Hellman or or any or a signature scheme or something like that. And so crypto verif lets you is sort of like easy crypt in that it lets you uh, try to with a machine aided prover tool write an equivalent to a pen and paper cryptographic game based proof of some sort of cryptography security property. Uh, and I can't even remember what some of the properties for PQXTH were. Um, session independence, something like that. Sure. And distinguishability of the keys. Yeah, that. For signatures, you might do uh, unforgeability and, and things like that. Um, and then for Kyber, you would do ciphertext, uh, chosen GCSE. message attack, chosen ciphertext attack and chosen message plaintext attack uh, resistance, uh, things like that. I've got chems on the brain. So I'm, I'm talking about a whole bunch of resistance and ciphertexts and all sorts of things. But actually, coming back for PQXTH, one interesting thing for your list of things to be worried oh, about yeah. was, uh, I don't know if you saw a blog post, but there is this re-encryption vulnerability oh, that is yes. theoretically there. But it does actually, does. it's not real. It's, it doesn't actually occur in PQXTH because it uses Kyber. Yes. And Kyber mixes in the public key into the yes. ciphertext in a way that avoids this. And that's not a property of any NCCA chem, but it should be a property of any NCCA chem that you choose to use in a protocol like PQXTH. Yes. So there's properties that are not in there that you actually might want, which things like Kyber do have. Yes. Which you should use because uh, it's important for the protocol above. It's definitely on my list because I have to keep going around to people who are trying to do things with chems. And I have to be like, do you need, do you care about not, you know, re-encapsulating a shared secret with a different public key? If the answer is yes, you have to look under the hood of your chem and make sure that it's either binding to the public key or something like that. And if it's not, you have to do that yourself higher up in your protocol. And that's not obvious unless you were thinking about these things or have exactly read right. your blog post or read your analysis. I, I'm going to give a shout out to Cass Kramers and his team who have published a new paper called Keeping Up with the Chems that tries to formalize some of these notions about binding properties of chems. Like, does it bind to the public key? Does it bind to the ciphertext? Both. What does that mean? That sort of things. And I think that didn't necessarily follow directly from your analysis, but very is in communi- communion with that sort of oh, stuff. Yes, yeah. And we, were, we would use that their, their definitions in the next work that we do. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice paper. Okay. Uh, we're running out of time. So anything else that you want to talk about, about your high assurance Kyber implementation that we haven't already touched on? <laughs> Good question. Uh, so I guess uh, one point we didn't touch at all is... That it's actually not only Rust, we also extract to C because we all like C. Right. <laughs> I, don't, so, I don't think about that side because I'm just sort of like, who, who cares? <laughs> it's got Rust. What else could you need? <laughs> no, it's a funny thing, right? And uh, so, for example, this archiver arc implementation is going into NSS, right? To, to be used in Firefox. Nice. And there and other places, people still don't have the choice as, as of today to use Rust, right? So this it's it's... When we started doing this code in Rust, and I think Franziskus and I would felt, of course, everybody just want the Rust code. But there's a sufficient number of people who said, oh, what, what about the C code? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. so in a way, it's a waste of time to develop that tool, but it's a, it's a uh, because in a futuristic sense, because we don't want people to be using C forever. But I think for the near future, uh, the fact that you can take the Rust crypto code and produce C code if you really, really need it. Mm-hmm. It's actually not a bad thing. <laughs> no, I, I don't think it's a bad thing because like there's sort of these competing these competing forcing functions, if you if you will. There's the forcing function of trying to get everyone to be able to move to quantum resilience, whatever that looks like. There's also the forcing function of 
we got to stop using C. Like we have better tools now. We would like to push towards using something like Rust. But like if you have to you have to pick one, like I am biased because I think, you know, we have to move sooner than later and we have a little bit of like a clock about the the PQ stuff and we've never seen a holistic cryptography asymmetric asymmetric cryptography transition on the scale of moving to post quantum like we've seen big tech companies and big parties like your chromes and your googles and your cloudflares and your amazons and tls move to move from rsa and things like that to elliptic curves and that's great but there's a lot of other cryptography deployments in the world that never successfully made that transition and they tried uh, so I'm thinking about those parties that n- have a big lift ahead of them if they're going to become quantum resilient. And in that regard, uh, if I have to pick my battles, I'm going to be like, here, have a pile of formally verified and generated lovely C uh, to, to do the, post, the, the post-quantum the migration. And then we will continue the, the long fight of uh, moving away from C to something even even the lovely formally verified, you know, pretty C that you, we split out of your Jeez. tools um, to something more like Rust. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think our experience in the, in the last few years has been that people would like to have like high assurance code, whether it's in C, even if it's in C, but not necessarily for code that already exists and works. Uh, right? yeah. So you either need to produce new code that is faster or code that they need, but they don't have. And this mm-hmm. was true for elliptic curves for a while that not everybody had all the elliptic curves that they needed and they would have liked it. So it's new code. So they, they would accept and change of paradigm when there's new code. And so this is why I think not just us, everybody in the verification and high assurance community, the hacks community basically thinks that post quantum is a great opportunity. You're going mm. to have to take a whole bunch of new code. So might as well, this might be the moment for you to switch to to Rust, but also to formal verification. It's not that costly as a process, really. Mm -hmm. Code is actually pretty fast. So there's really not that much of a, this is the right incentive. This is the moment to do that transition, perhaps. And especially because there are some unfortunate downside constraints to some of the post-quantum primitives that we have on offer, which is lattices. The lattices are very fast but they're big. They're bigger on the wire. The keys are bigger. The in caps on, are bigger and, and things like dilithium uh, are bigger for signatures on the wire. And that's tough. And it's, there's only so much wiggle room there. But if we can make everything else about, about using them attractive, formally verified fast, it's not a super hard sell to be like, yes, this is bigger on the wire, but it's very, very competitive with some of your, you know, pr- battle-tested production, highly optimized elliptic curves. That makes it that much easier. And then making it good C so they don't have to transition a whole tool chain to be able to use it over to something like Rust makes it easier to adopt in a harder cell, uh, a, a less hard cell for them to make. <laughs> um What's next for Crispin? And what's next for LibCrux or Hacks, the tool chain? What's uh what's on your agenda next? Or well, you don't want to spoil it? <laughs> no, I mean uh, I mean one one thing I hinted at uh, earlier is so yes, we will also do like a vectorized version of MLCAM, which I think is nice because it is way faster because there's cool. a lot we can parallelize, and then I think better support for something like Proverif. Uh, is also cool. very interesting because with that we can actually prove we do that on like our we, we have a TLS implementation a TLS mm. 1.3 implementation and on there we want to show off essentially that we can do a cryptographic proof like a proof symbolic proof for the security of TLS but at the same time we can use something like F star to show that like the serialization or something is correct and yes. both on the same Rust code. And so I think that's a nice way of showing what a tool like Hex can do. That's really cool. And as a co-chair of the TLS working group, I'm very interested <laughs> in this project. Cool. Thomas, do you got anything? 
You know, I was worried I wouldn't have any material for this, and pretty much this whole thing has just been me getting way the hell out of your way. <laughs> I realized at the end of this that this is post quantum rust and formal methods, uh-huh. and I don't know what I don't know why I thought I'd have anything to say here. <laughs> so, no, I'm I'm good. This is this has been a Deirdre heavy thing, and that's been great to listen to. This has been all of my favorite things. <laughs> all all you had to do is throw in some misogynies, and I would send you like. <laughs> a bottle of champagne and some flowers, but unfortunately, the the isogeny friends been a bit quiet lately. Um, Francisco is Karthik, thank you so very much for your time. Security, cryptography, whatever is a side project from Deirdre Coddling, Thomas Tachek, and Dear David Adrian. Our editor is Nettie Smith. You can find the podcast online at scwpod and securitycryptographywhatever.com. And the hosts online at Durham Crustalum, at TQBF, and at David Adrian. You can buy merch at merch.securitycryptographywhatever.com. If you like the pod, give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you rate your favorite podcasts. Thank you for listening.